Good afternoon, everyone. This is Wallace Johnson from Families Helping Family, and welcome to our webinar, Raise Your Voice Self-Advocacy Webinar. Our webinar today will be provided by our guest speaker, Mr. Rashad Bristow. He is uh, of Bitter or Better Motivations with LLC. Mr. Briscoe is a motivational speaker and an author encouraging people to maximize their potential to achieve goals and their aspirations in life. And at the end of the webinar, please watch for our survey so you uh, can complete it. All attendees are muted. If you have a question to ask Mr. Briscoe, please use the chat box and ask your question. And again, welcome to the webinar. This is being recorded live on Facebook. Take it away. Thank you, Wallace, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar. I'd like to say thank you to Family Health Families of Southwest Louisiana for this opportunity to present on Raise Your Voice. And what we're gonna be talking about, we're gonna talk about the, there we go. A little bit about me, uh, why we should advocate, what is grassroots advocacy, and how to get your voice heard. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, again, I, for those who may not know, I was actually born with one arm. And being born with one arm, I got an opportunity to find out just how life can be when it, growing up with a disability. And that pushed me into an arena where I wanted to do more for those who weren't able to do for themselves. Because one thing that I've learned people will take advantage of you for what you do not know. And I wanted to find out more that could be done and how I could have an impact in it. And this is one of the main reasons on why we should advocate. Uh, we're talking about rights. Individuals with disabilities have the same rights as citizens, if not more. Oftentimes there's a conclusion believed that just because, I've learned in life many times, people will dismiss what they don't understand. And when they do that, they start to put a limit and start to try to prevent those who have an intention and a desire to do greater things, to try to be quiet, uh, to try to sit on the sidelines and accept the way things are just due to the fact that they may not have been uh, challenged or may, they may not have been brought into place. And not only that, another reason why it's important that we raise our voices is because we wanna make a choice about our own lives. In times past, there were many children who were born with disabilities. Um, I'm talking about during the era of the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, that when children were born with disabilities, unfortunately, there was a belief that those children were deviant, um, that they were born uh, as a evil judgment upon possibly the parents based upon certain c circumstances. And they were placed away in hospitals and asylums. And oftentimes, unfortunately, a lot of those children were forgotten about. A lot of those children were placed there and the families uh, never really did continue to keep much of a relationship with them because they were in a custodial care. And, you know, fortunately we live in a society now where many people have started advocating where this is not uh, the way things are and the way things can be. The other thing is, Another reason why it's important to raise our voice, especially when it comes down to employment and just equal opportunity, we want to be contributing members to society. Again, you heard me say that it's easy for people to be dismissed based upon what they don't understand. A little bit more about me being born with one arm. Uh, my grandparents actually raised me and my grandfather told me some words that really changed my life. He said, son, your disability doesn't define you. It's your determination. Uh, because I find myself asking God the question that probably many people ask God every day of their life. Lord, why me? Why was I the one who had to be born with a disability? Why was I the one born with this uniqueness? And the reason I was asking those questions had nothing to do with my self-perception. It was based upon the perception that other people had started trying to label me and starting to try to place me into a box of believing what they felt like I could and could not do. And it was very frustrating, was emotionally hurtful. And that's another reason why it's important that we raise our voice because we have to make sure that we don't allow people to have this negative philosophy and start to believe these things about uh, 
uh, communities with disabilities because we have every aspiration to do great things. Some of you may have heard me tell this story before, but I believe it bears repeating. There was a man who was walking down the highway, down the sidewalk. And as he was walking, he passed by this house where there was this old man in a rocking chair. He was rocking back and forth. Well, as the old man was rocking back and forth, he heard there was, he saw there was a dog laying beside the old man on, and he was howling. And the dog was going, so the young man is walking. He sees that the old man is rocking in the rocking chair. It just seems just as unfazed as unfazed can be. But yet this dog is howling. So as the man walks by, he's looking and he starts to pass the house up. But the dog is continuously moaning. So the young man draws a clue. He said, hold up. Let me stop and ask this man, why is this dog What's wrong with this dog? Why is he howling? So the young man turns around, he goes back to the house, goes to the porch, he says, excuse me, sir. He said, the old man, yes, sir, what can I do for you? He said, I noticed that your dog there seems to be howling and you seem to be unfazed because you're just continuously rocking in the rocking chair. He said, well, why is the dog howling? He's, the old man replied and said, well, the dog is laying on the nail. So then the young man asked questions. He said, well, why doesn't he get off of the nail? He said, because it's not hurting him bad enough. And my friends, when it comes down to raising your voice, when it comes down to disability rights, there are many people who are moan and groan and complain about what's wrong. But the, another group of people have to be willing to get off the nail, to get off the nail, to get off of the pain and start trying to start advocating and doing those things that can be monumental in our movement with disability rights and raise our voice to advocate for those who may not be in a position to advocate for themselves. Because remember when I talked about how uh, during the 50s through the 70s and the 80s, that there were many people who were uh, placed in institutions based upon their disabilities. Well, see, now we live in a society where we wanna live in our own homes and participate in our own communities. When I was five years old, I'll never forget I was invited to attend Shriners High School in Shreveport, Louisiana, and they were fitting me for a prosthetic limb, an artificial arm. And for two weeks, I had to go stay at Shriners Hospital. And within that two weeks, my friends, it was the loneliest feeling I'd ever had. I'll never forget it for as long as I live. And I'm 45 now. That was 40 years ago. And I can remember it just like it was yesterday. I'll never forget when my grandparents dropped me off and they were telling me of encouragement that I was gonna get a, a or that I was gonna get an arm and I was gonna learn how to use it and then I'd be able to come home. Now my grandparents had every great intention. I'm not saying anything slighting them. They were just going through the process that was in place. Once they left, I never forget. I ran to the window and I watched that car drive off. And as I was watching that car drive off, a feeling came over me. And that feeling was loneliness because I felt like I was in a world by myself. Now, mind you, I was not the only one at the hospital. I was not the only one that was there with a physical disability. Because if you've been to Shriners and other children's hospitals, you know that there are children with various disabilities and uniquenesses and things along those lines. But being there for two weeks, I feel like I'd been abandoned. I felt like I'd been left, and it was an emotionally draining experience for me. That's why now there were people who were advocating that we're able to live in our own homes, our own communities, and be able to live the fulfillment of the lives that we want to live. And not only that, we want to have equal access and opportunities. It's, it's a very disappointing feeling to be dismissed before you're ever given an opportunity to do anything, especially when it comes to an arm. Uh, excuse me, I'm talking about an arm by myself, but when people dismiss you because they feel like it's something that you can't do, those several words right there, you can't do this, can become some of the most frustrating words that you can hear because it's, it's frustrating to be dismissed before you ever get an opportunity to do what you want to. So we're talking about advocacy. And the question is, what is advocacy? Well, advocacy is taking an action in support or opposition of a cause or issue. So you can be in a position where you're advocating for something to take place, or you can be in a position where you're advocating for something to not take place. 
that's why it's important, especially as parents of children with disabilities and individuals ourselves who have disabilities, it's important to stay abreast of the laws and how things will affect us. A little bit more about me. I have a 14-year-old son who's on the autism spectrum. And my main concern, just like any parent, is to make sure that my child is taken care of after I'm gone. And I want to make sure that there are laws that will protect, and not, and not only laws that protect, but that there are services in place that will offer the assistance that's needed for his independent living. These are things that were not in place 50 years ago, 30 years ago. But these services are becoming in place because it's people like us who've opened up our mouths and not accepted the way things are. There are two types of advocacy. There's individual advocacy and there's systems advocacy. Now, when it comes down to individual advocacy, it usually spills over into systems advocacy. But an individual advocacy is usually based upon some kind of violation of an individual's rights or just something that doesn't seem like it's equal, equal or there's an equality of a reason that that person should be there. I'll give an example. Sometimes, uh, let's use an example of someone in a wheelchair. When you go into how individual advocacy became system advocacy, there was someone who was not satisfied with the fact that there were locations that were not wheelchair accessible. Well, that individual started to challenge the system on based on the fact that these locations were not wheelchair accessible. And now, due to the fact that they've done that, it became a movement where all of a sudden it became a systems advocacy. The reason it became systems advocacy is because a lot of times, many of us have the same concerns and issues. It's just the fact that there's strength in numbers. And when there's strength in numbers, then we're able to be able to have the impact that's needed. But make no mistake about it, more times than not, probably 90% of the time, our advocacy usually begins as individual advocacy. And from that point, it becomes progressive. And when it becomes progressive, again, there's strength in numbers. Because here's another reason why it's important with, in, with system advocacy. It's focused on changing laws and policies that affect large groups of people. So system individual advocacy could be something where it could be involved in the school system, education. But then when we're looking at systems advocacy, that's when we're talking about the possible municipality law changes. And not only that, but we're talking about uh, state and federal government changes also. So uh, focusing on individual advocacy, focus on changing the situation uh, for one person. And that was something that I, I'd already uh, started talking about. But not only that, the accommodations of, at the, like I said, school, job, church, et cetera, somewhere the accommodations can be made and met for that one individual. But more times than not, to echo what I said earlier, a lot of times it leads right into what we look at as being the systems advocacy. And with the systems advocacy, that's when it gets to be a little bit more. And that's when we're bringing a lot more attention to an issue or concern. Because it's focusing on the changing of laws and policies that affect large groups of people, uh, federal, state, and local. And it's important when we're looking at that to start getting in contact with your city councilmen, your state representatives, uh, your legislatures, people along those lines. Now, one thing I've learned in advocacy, I found out that it's more advantageous when you start in your local municipalities and then progressively work your way up. For example, if you see that there's a change that you'd like to see within your, within your city, within your town, that's when you would want to go look, talk to your councilman or your parish commissioner for wherever you live in that particular region and bring that to their attention. And then from that point, once you talk to that commissioner, it's important to do this. One reason it's important to do this is because you want to make sure that you're putting it on their radar. The second thing is you want to make sure that you have other people who become aware of these things. It's kind of like, uh, have you ever heard, it's called uh, subliminal messaging. Have you ever, remember when you go buy a car and when you bought that car, before you bought the car, let me use it like this. You never saw as many of those models and vehicles on the road, but it seemed like after you bought that car, it seemed like every corner that you turn, you see the same model car and you're like, I never noticed that many cars before. Why? 
because now your subconscious has been brought to is brought to your subconscious attention. And that's the same thing that when we're doing systems advocacy, when it comes out to talking to legislators, councilmen, and state representatives, we're wanting to bring attention to them. Because here's the thing that's most important. Make no assumption because of the political position that they're in that they have insight in all. I think one of the biggest mistakes I made and starting with advocacy was I made a mistake of believing because they were in these elected positions. They had all of the insight and they knew all of the laws and they knew all of the things. And I find out, my friends, that was not the case. And for the most part, that's not the case. Let's keep in mind, many of our legislators, state representatives, city councilmen, these are people who are basically considered in a part-time position. This is not their full-time job. So make no assumptions just because they sit on this council or they sit in this board or whatever the case may be, they have all of the insight and they have all of the knowledge. You are their biggest asset. You are the person that can give them the information that they need because I've heard this more times than I can count. I didn't know. Those three words are some words that you'll probably hear quite often when you first make a presentation to any elected official. Most of the times, it's important to make sure that we start at grassroots advocacy. And you may ask, what is grassroots advocacy? Well, grassroots is basically just like what you think about is at when you get down to the root of it. It's organized by efforts where people have a shared mission and a shared cause. My friends, one thing that I've learned, uh, especially being an individual growing up with a disability and being a parent of a child with a disability, it's a very relieving when you're able to connect yourselves with other people who are dealing with some of the same concerns that you're dealing with. One, it's refreshing to know that you're not in this by yourself. Two, it gives an opportunity to start talking to other people to find out, I know what I see from my viewpoint, but how do you see it from your viewpoint? Once you're able to do that, that's when you're able to start organizing campaigns, getting things done. It's effective that way because when you have a large crowd delivering the same unanimous message at the same time, that's when we start getting the attention of many people. Now, don't misunderstand me. Sometimes you may be the Lone Ranger by yourself, but make sure that you continue to stay vigilant on the path that you're being directed to go on, that you're feeling it in your heart to move on. Because it doesn't matter when it comes down to grassroots. Sometimes you just have to get back to the basics. I'll give you an example, like the palm tree. When you think about the palm tree, the palm tree, it doesn't look like it could have much of an impact. I mean, you know, it grows tall. It doesn't have many branches. But have you ever noticed, and this is ironic because we're just transitioning to hurricane season, palm trees, oftentimes they bend, but they don't break. Why? is because of the way that they're rooted. They're rooted in such a way that even though the storms blow, they're never in a position where they break. And my friends, when it comes down to grassroots efforts, we have to make sure that we're connected, where we stay rooted, and we don't bend, well, we're bend, but we don't break when it comes down to the storms that may come. Because make no mistake about it, when it comes down to advocacy, don't think that this is just going to be a smooth road. Don't think that every time that you go through the door that someone's going to be just successful. Say, hey, come on in. We were just thinking about changing this law or whatever the case may be. That's not always the case. But if you stay the course, you stay focused, stay vigilant, then there's the, you'll see so much done. And I've noticed something else. If you ever notice about palm trees, they're always in a row. Most of the time, their roots are entangled within each other. That's why, my friends, they're strength in numbers. Because it keeps, it's important to have people that can help you to remain steadfast, focused, and grounded. You may ask the question, why should I advocate? I'm not actually dealing with any issues. I, I don't have the same concerns as somebody else. You advocate because you want to make a difference. Because policymakers, they really need your perspective. Now, here's something that is, I've seen happen quite often. And you probably had this happen with you also. Once you make yourself known, to your elected officials. And when I say elected officials, I'm talking about uh, general uh, city, council, state. They oftentimes will want to come talk to you and ask you your input on saying, 
how can this have an impact if I vote in this direction? So it's important uh, why you should advocate and make sure that the policy makers know your perspective and uh, your expertise. Because let me tell you something, growing up or raising a child with a disability, you're an expert. You're an expert in your own field and you're able to talk about things that someone else may not have insight. Now, communicating with professionals, just like I said earlier, professionals, and I'm using this as a very broad range, professionals can be your teachers, elected officials, they can be uh, employers, medical staff. Make no assumption for the position that they hold, they have all the insight that you have. Make no assumption that they've dealt with some of the issues that you have. You remember, they're professionals, but you're the scholar on disabilities. It's important that we let many know. I give an example. When you go to the mechanic shop to take your car in, even though this person is the certified mechanic, even though they spend hours in schools, even though they spend hours breaking down motors, transmissions, or whatever the profession is, they're going to still ask you this one important question when you take your vehicle to them what's wrong with it? But wait a minute, they're the professionals. They're the professionals on fixing the problem, but you're the one that has to let them know what the problem is to begin with. That's why it's important to express the importance to our elected officials on why things are the way they are. And again, like I said, make no assumption that they know. Some of the concerns when it comes down to talking to the professionals is I'm afraid these are important people. Uh, I can't do this. Uh, I may make someone mad. I may get someone offended. I don't know enough to advocate. Uh, I don't have the time to advocate. You know, here's one thing that I've learned. These uh, professionals are still people too. And it's important that you talk to these professionals because one thing that I'm starting to learn, and I've heard this uh, based upon systems change with other people that I've talked with also, most of the time, they're in a position that where they can relate. Most of the time, they have a loved one. It may be a, a removed cousin or maybe a neighbor or a family friend who has dealt with some type of a, a donor disability spectrum where they have a little insight. They may not be completely knowledgeable like you, but they have some kind of insight. And it's important that you do your research. Do your research before you ever go talk to a professional. That way, especially when you're talking about elected officials, because you may be surprised. One of the main reasons in the 60s why uh, we saw a change with disability rights on the federal level was because President JFK, John F. Kennedy Jr., his sister had a disability. So he saw some of the injustices that she suffered because she was lobotomized. He saw that growing up and his impact and his heart was open because he was personally impacted by this. When you're able to talk to people who are personally impacted by some of the challenges that we have, then you're able to start pricking away and chipping away at what may be considered a hard person. Uh, these are important people. Yes, they are important people in the positions that they hold, but they're not as important for the interest or loved one that you have in your heart. Make no mistake about it. There are no big eyes and little use when it comes down to disability rights. And, and don't be intimidated based upon the fact they're elected officials and this is a congressman, this is a senator, this is a city councilman. I'm not disrespecting the position. I'm just saying your personal interests outweigh the title of any person that you need to talk to on the behalf of yourself or a loved one to get the results that's necessary and imperative to live an independent and successful life. I may make someone mad. I was always told you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. It's not intended to be intrusive. And let, and let me say this, preference this. I always use sound judgment in who you're talking to. And I always use sound judgment in the way you talk to individuals. Because just because you're coming in emotionally charged, that individual may seem like they're very nonchalant. They may not appear to as if they care or whatever the case may be. Don't mistake the nonchalant behavior for someone that's unconcerned. There are many people who have different dispositions about themselves. Sometimes that's just that's just a character. And if you think about it, there are certain people that you know uh, that may be nonchalant, you're probably not in head in agreement with me. I don't know enough to advocate. Yes, you do. You really do. You know that you have a loved one who feel like opportunities could be better for 
And what you want to do is you just need to make that and express that and let it be known. There's no quote textbook for how to per se, to particularly uh, advocate. Now there are some guidelines and I'm gonna follow up with those shortly, but having the heart and the passion to do it, that will do it. And then you may ask yourself to say they won't listen or nothing will change, what's the point? Many people say things won't change, but they really will. A little bit more about me. My background is criminal justice. I used to be a deputy sheriff and a juvenile probation officer. I worked in law enforcement for 16 years. One of the laws that I saw take place in the 90s that I thought was interesting, domestic violence. When I first started law enforcement in 1994, there was no law on the books for domestic violence. Now, there is. Domestic violence came into place because before domestic violence, there was only this charge called battery. So a husband or a wife could have a physical altercation and there was no recourse for it. Uh, because most of the time, people felt like the law enforcement felt like that was a, a household issue. Now, only time that you, I saw arrests being made was when there was some type of uh, violent act in the process. Just, I'll never forget, I went on a call one time and this still was not a domestic violence. It was a domestic violence call, but the law of domestic violence was not on the books. The wife actually hit the husband in the head with a skillet, but Initially, what was happening is the husband was physically abusing the wife and the skillet, him being hit in the head with the skillet, was actually uh, 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 her way of intervening, trying to get away from him so she get away from him. Now, when the arrest was made, now mind you, I preference this, this was back in the 90s, both of them were arrested just for battery. It was not as definitive as it is now. But now in the 2020, we have domestic violence on the books. So domestic violence, how did this come into place? I'm glad you asked. There were, though, there were abused wives who started connecting with other abused wives, and then they started making a movement, and then they find themselves on different radio programs, talk shows, one being Oprah, and it started getting on the radar of those uh, political professionals. And now here we have a law. But just imagine, but let me ask you this question. How long has domestic violence taken place since in this world? Probably since the beginning of the time. But isn't it interesting that now we have it on the books? Here's the point that I'm making. I'm getting at the fact that someone was not content with the status quo. Someone said no is more than battery. This is something that's a domestic violence. Now it's defined. Even battery, when you think about it, the battery used to be vague. Now you have battery of elected official, battery of a school teacher, and it goes on and on. Why? Because these laws came into place based upon the fact that they were presented due to the fact that people had concerns on this. So when you ask this, when the comment is made, nothing will change, what's the point? I beg to differ. A lot can change. And, and the point is you can make a great impact. So in coming down and talking to professionals when it comes down to advocacy, self-advocacy, you want to start building relationships, but before you build relationships with, with the professionals, and, I'm, and more in the vein of elected officials, do your homework. Find out about these individuals. Again, you may find out that this person's grandchild may be, uh, have, a, have a disability or uniqueness. That way you're able to know. Because one thing about connecting with people, the whole way people connect is they're able to relate in some shape, form, or fashion. Uh, know as much as you can about your legislator or your professional. It's important to do that because you don't want to go on uninformed. You want to impress this person to let them know that you've done your research. Don't get me wrong. You don't want to go in where you're trying to flatter anyone, but you want to let them know that you know where you, you have enough insight in them where they stand and what interventions can be made. Sometimes it may be good to let them know, look, I know you voted for this back in uh, 2012 and this help this community now, I need your assistance for this. Again, make no assumptions that they know. Here's what happens. Oftentimes, laws go into place based upon political favors. A lot of the times, what happens, one professional will complement another professional's legislative agenda in support, based upon another support for another law or piece of legislation. That's why it's important that you emphasize it. 
just because some because there are many elected officials that will agree to allow and once it is gone into place then they get challenged by their constituents and the uh, communities that they serve based upon law and again you hit them three words i didn't know that's important why it's important to stand up that's why it's important to start paying attention if you don't already to what legislation is coming also make sure that you just meet people where they are be polite be friendly be positive be helpful understand Sometimes the answer may be no. I have a personal philosophy where when you turn no around and you spell it backwards, no is on because it's on now. Because you told me no, you've opened up a door for me to challenge uh, the status quo. And that's something I plan to do. Heavy elevated speech down packed. I know, even myself. Sometimes once we get emotionally charged, we can go on and on and on. But if you ever go to the state capitol, these individuals are coming in between meetings and in between sessions to committee meetings. And sometimes you may have a two to three minute window. It's important that you're gonna probably be talking and moving at the same time, trying to get with them, to give them the pointers about your present, what, what your interest is. So make sure that you have it down pack and get to the point. Practice what you're gonna say. Know your facts and your story. If you need statistics, know your statistics. I always show your compassion because one thing, when people hear your heart, that can't be mistaken. People can know, sometimes it's just compassionate conversation can move and do so much greater. Also, uh, see how clearly you look at your uh, legislature. Here's what's important. Don't make threats. Don't threaten the legislators, don't threaten the elected officials. I believe there's some moves that's just best made in silence. I didn't get a chance to get uh, my constituent on my side, but sometimes it's important that you just go ahead and talk to somebody else. And here's something that's very important and very key, my friends. Don't get distracted behind political affiliations. You would be amazed on some of the political affiliations that you'll be able to get the results that you're looking for, for some of the things that people can say and do that can be effective for your agenda. Uh, back in 2009, 19, last year, I got an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. for the National Conference on Independent Living. And we went to go see our state congressman, and that was uh, Senator Bill Cassidy, Bill Cassidy, excuse me. And one thing about it, we were already in D.C., we were at this office, we had an appointment to see him, but when we got there, he was already in another meeting. Busy people, in my opinion, busy people understand busy people. So we waited. We waited probably for about an hour. And then his staff assistant said, well, Senator would like to see you in the Capitol. So we ended up leaving underground, riding the tram, subway. And uh, we went to where he was. He was still in the meeting. And then after that, he made 30 minutes to talk to us. He talked to us we got a chance to express our concerns and we brought some attention to him because there was some words that he said that stuck with me that i didn't know but see here's another thing and i thought this was interesting and i would suggest that you try this also oftentimes professionals are so used to us coming for them ask them this question what can i do to help you i've turned around and asked that question myself to certain professionals and it stuns them because there's in such a point where they're so used to everyone coming to them I'm wanting something, ask them, what can I do to help you? And the thing, when I, that question, I asked that question to Senator Cassidy. He said, you know, I'm glad that you asked that. I do ask this question, do ask this of you. Whenever you hear about a piece of legislation or something that may be of challenge to what your principles are, please reach out to me, let me know, and ask for the full story before we start uh, drawing conclusions. Some of the resource agencies I have listed that can assist you with any of the concerns that you have are the Families Helping Families. My friends, I just believe the Families Helping Families are God sent agencies for us to be able to have some people that we can call and connect with who can help us navigate through some of the issues, challenges, and concerns that we have. You have Families Helping, depending on what region of the state you're on with this webinar, we have uh, Families Helping Families of Southeast Louisiana, which is region one. We also have Families Helping Families of Greater Baton Rouge, which is in Region 2. We have Bayou Land Families Helping Families, 
which serves as Region 3. Family Seven Families of Arcadia, which serves as regions, Region 5. We have Southwest Family Seven Families, Region 5. Also, I just made a mistake. I realized I called uh, Family Seven Families of Arcadia Region 4. Now, Family Seven Families of Southwest Louisiana, Region 5. I apologize for that, Susan. Also, Family Seven Families at Crossroads for Region 6. And then we have Family Seven Families of Region 7 and Family Seven Families of Region 8. This PowerPoint will be available for anyone who has any kind of questions. Also, some of the resources that I would suggest that you get a chance to look at. Um, Louisiana Developmental Disabilities Council, www.ladc.org.org. Uh, there are many great resources that you're able to look at from this. And also, if you follow them, they'll also give you insight to what some of the legislation may be going on or some things that are being presented, and just to keep you abreast of what's going on in our great state of Louisiana. Also, if you're not already a part of it, LeCan is something to be uh, involved in, especially if you have a desire to do self-advocacy and to be proactive for those individuals with disabilities. Uh, LeCan, they advocate for system change for support of children with disabilities to live in their own homes. Like I said, you know, full inclusion in the schools and in the communities. Now, here's one of my favorites, and I think is, and this is what my presentation was based on a lot of, Partners in policy making. For those of you who really want to get involved in uh, advocacy and raising your voice, under the website of Louisiana Developmental Disability Council, Partners in Policy Making is a national leadership training program. And I had an opportunity myself to be able to uh, participate in, which gave me a lot of uh, instruction on how to effectively advocate. Some of the things that I previously mentioned were those things. Here's what, here's what we have to look at. Um, nobody knows it all, but it's important that we link up with other people. And it was really refreshing to be a part of, part of Partners in Policy Making because I was with parents of children with disabilities and I find out something that really blessed me. I was not on an island by myself. So often that's the way it happens. You know, Martin Luther King said it best. Life is no staircase of ease. We all have our problems. But despite it all, we must keep moving. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. My contact information is here. And if I can ever be of assistance to you, uh, you can visit me on my website, www.rashardbristow.net, my social media platforms, and even my phone numbers there. And at this time, I thank you for this opportunity to present. Hopefully, I said something that was of information to you and empowerment. And I'll turn it back over to Families Helping Families of Southwest Louisiana. Uh, anybody have any questions? Now is the time to ask questions. Um, we would love for you to give us your feedback. I know one of the things that I like that you brought out that uh, was interesting was when you made the comparison with the uh, auto mechanic, you know, and, and a person, you know, coming to the auto mechanic and how they were the expert to, you right. know, they went and got all their training and all that, but yeah. you were the one that had the vehicle that needed the repairs and you were the one that knew uh, what was wrong with your vehicle. So you had to go to the uh, mechanic and so I thought that was a perfect uh, description of advocacy mm -hmm. with policymakers and our uh, other officials and people that we work with. That was a very good insight of looking at it that way. Um, Thank you for that. And like I said, that's, that's an important way to look at it too. Keep that in mind. Um, so in advocacy, I know that's important because you know, obviously we, we at families have families know how important advocacy is. Advocacy is something that's important all year round, right? Wouldn't you say? Yes. 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 And you know, one thing about advocacy is don't don't dismiss it and keep it down just to the uh, legislative session. You know, legislative session only happens uh, whether they meet for several months. Now, this year, twenty twenty, was unique because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But advocacy happens all year where once it does make it to 
the legislation, that's when that takes place. But it's important that we advocate all year and there's no issue too small and there's no issue too major. If it's on your heart to advocate for it, advocate for it. And don't feel like you're gonna be on an island by yourself because once you start, you'd be amazed uh, how many people are attracted to the same concerns that you have. And, and I like how you brought that out too. No, no issue is too small or too little because, no. you know, some people out there may feel, well, it doesn't matter if I vote or not. You know, my voice, my vote doesn't count. My voice doesn't count. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say to someone who maybe doesn't vote because they feel like their vote doesn't matter? Well, Wallace, what I say is this, and I use this as an example to try to, to give a little bit more validity to what you're saying. Uh, many times people are dismissed, not even voting, but not just voting, but not speaking up. It's the equivalent of using a piece of loose leaf paper. One piece of loose leaf paper may not seem like it has much of an impact, but when you go in Walmart and you buy a pack of loose leaf paper, have you ever noticed how heavy it is? But one sheet of paper is very light. But when you have more sheets of paper that continue to compound, it gets to have a little bit more weight. The same thing is equivalent to your vote. You may not feel like it has much of an impact, but when you turn around and start compiling it and adding it up with others, you'd be amazed impression that it leaves. And someone was asking, how can people with disabilities, uh, let me roll back to the question, it passed me up, I apologize for a minute. How can no people problem. with disabilities advocate when they cannot go to Baton Rouge because of the coronavirus? Well, in several ways. One, now the good thing about it, and we're seeing it now, just like what we're doing now, there's several ways to advocate. One, we have uh, electronic platforms now. There's social media, there's Zoom, but not only that, depending on what your issue is, I would still, if you're advocating and you can't go to Baton Rouge, you need to start with your local municipality or start with your state representative. Make those phone calls. And I didn't say this in the presentation, but this is important. Nothing is going to dismiss better than uh, can get dismissed when you make a phone call. Now, sometimes email, they'll sift through email because email can go through the, uh, to their staff assistant. But when you start making those phone calls, people will remember you. Um, even in the Bible, there was a story of the widow and uh, she was going to the judge and she said, just because this woman worried me is why she got her results. So just continue to reach out. You can make a phone call to just your local state representative, or even if you're not able to go to Baton Rouge because everyone's not in a position at the moment with COVID-19, but make those phone calls, uh, post on your platforms, whatever the case may be, whatever your concern is, that way you can get the results that you're hoping for. Um, if someone doesn't know who their elected officials or policy makers are, um, or the people like that, that they need to contact, do you have a way to help them or tell them how they could find out who their elected officials or policy makers are? Yes. Um, one thing is this, I'm glad you asked that question. There's actually an app, uh, that you can go to. I'm a, I'm a, try to see if it's called Go Boat, G-E-A-U-X Boat. That app will give you the insight. I'm, I'm going to try this real quick. Well, I don't think it'll show it. There it is. Go Boat. It'll show you your address. It'll show you everything that you need to. But uh, Go Boat, G-E-A-U-X-V-O-T. Go to your app store for Louisiana. Go Vote. And it'll break down everything that you need to know from your judicial districts to your polling locations, to your elected official, to your registrar of voters. It's very informative. But that's Go, G-E-A-U-X, Vote. That app is a one-shop stop for, many, for much of the information that you would need. Okay, Go, G-O-G-E-A-U-X.com. No, G E A U X boat. Oh, okay. G E A U X boat.com. Well, I'm typing it in the, uh, the little chat box for y'all. There it goes. Hopefully, okay. I spelled it right. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But I've used this website, y'all, and this is a good resource. And I also have this app on my phone. Yes. Uh, it, it, it is very good. Uh, thank you for bringing out that wonderful resource. Um, if mm -hmm. anybody out there is listening and they also need further help, we have LACAN leaders in every region of our state that can help you find out who your policymakers are, uh, who your elected officials are, uh, who your Bessie board members are, and so forth like that. And they're willing to help you or give you information too to help you in your advocacy efforts also. And all this is done free of charge. Um, and if you want to know how to find your McCann leader, you can contact your area of family, family's office and they'll help you uh, get connected to your the CAM leader in your area. Does anyone else have any other questions to ask at this time? The chat box, the chat box popped up on my end. So I see one where it says, would you say that developing relations with people of influence is something that should not be seasonal? That's actually very correct. Uh, developing relationships with people of influence should always be consistent. Do not wait until uh, there is a concern or an issue. It's re really good to just let people know who you are. Uh, it's good to let people know who uh, the, who lives it within their judicial districts uh, because what happens, stay in front of them. Let them know you by name because I've seen this happen. There are people who will, will call those professionals that we're talking about, those elected officials. They'll call and ask you, a constituent, hey, this piece of legislation just came before me. Uh, if I was to vote this, what would my vote have an impact on this with your loved one or your child or your life? So it's important to make sure that it's not just seasonal, but it should be basically a way of life. You stay in front of your elected officials and your professionals at all times. That way, um, for another reason, that way when they see you, they'll never know what you're coming for. Good point. Good point. All righty. Anybody else have any more questions? And at the end of this webinar, please remember to watch and complete our survey. Um, the data or the information from that helps us to keep doing what we're doing and show that we're, we're doing workshops and training. And if you have any workshops or trainings you'd like us to offer that we haven't presented, please let us know in the survey. Um, give us your feedback there about what you would like to see done training-wise so we can hopefully put something on together and offer it. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone attending um, this webinar. I'm glad you are on. And we have webinars constantly going on. And the way to find out what we're doing is to go to our Families Help Families in Southwest Louisiana Facebook page. You can go there for information. Or you can go to our website, Families Help Families. Uh, it's the address is www.fhfswla.org, and you can see all our, our workshops and trainings and webinars that we're offering there. Um, again, Mr. Bristow, we are glad, so glad that you uh, presented information on uh, raising your voice for self-advocacy, because we know this is important, especially in the day and age that we live in now, where there's issues wherever you turn, and sometimes we need input like this to know what to do when we have issues, how to go about getting help or seeking help, and you presented some great information to help with this endeavor. Um, I noticed in the chat box that there were a lot of people commenting and saying how wonderful your presentation was, uh, talking about your stories and the with your grandmother and what all they've done to help you and stuff like that. Well, that's what Families Help Families is all about too, uh, if you haven't heard about us. And so again, thank you everyone for tuning in and watching this webinar. Remember at the end, please complete our survey. And thank you, Mr. Briscoe, for doing this wonderful presentation for us. And we hope that y'all have thank a you, wonderful, Austin. wonderful weekend. Okay, and I'm just interject real quick. I emailed the presentation to you, Wallace, because I see that there are some inquiries about the uh, PowerPoint presentation. You Thank you, sir. And I'll email it out to the attendees on the webinar. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Y'all have a great weekend. Stay safe. And stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.